Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity? Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line. Between old and new, between death and life, there stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. Hey, it's good to see you guys today. Um, please excuse our mess. So uh, this has been kind of fun to see it all happen. And uh, yet on Monday, I was standing right over there and I was talking to one of the construction workers and they were tearing down half of the facade, if you remember what it looked like on the backside. So they tore half of it down, and as it fell down, I looked at the, other, at the guy, and I said, uh, is it too late to say we changed our mind? And so uh, it is too late. And so thank you for navigating all of that and all of that and, and all of this, and uh, we just praise God for uh, the ability to be able to do this. And we would look at uh, our story, and we think about where we've been, and all you MC3ers know this, and so um, how God has taken us uh, uh, through the hills and the valleys, and here we are, and this is a small little valley uh, that's getting ready, we're getting ready to see some great things happen in here. I do know that the, um, on Friday, the, the general contractor and the project manager said, everything in here will happen fast, everything out there will happen a little bit more slowly uh, due to weather and, and heavy equipment, things of that nature, but super excited about all that, and we praise God uh, for, for that, and this is a testament Yesterday, I was visiting Miss Bonnie, who's in the hospital, and she was talking about um, just the church and, and was just grateful and thankful. And I said, and, and I said, well, and, and thankful for the staff. And I said, well, actually, we're thankful for you and for all those that have been coming with us and that have navigated uh, through some times where we weren't sure exactly what God uh, was going to do. So. Uh, anyways, we just thank you for all of that. And today, by the way, if you hear something, and I, if I lose my shoes, it's because the stage is a little sticky. I don't know if you've ever seen Home Alone, where the guy's going down the steps, and he, he, he's out of his shoes, and he's out of his socks. That may happen today. And so if it happens, just, just pay no attention to all of that. So, hey, we're getting ready to head into a, a week of service, and, G, and uh, Jim will talk about this in just a second, uh, but Gerardo has... Um, uh, come up with some really incredible things for us to do 
all this week. Okay, this is all this week. We've got something on Monday, tomorrow. Uh, we will be at uh, Lilburn uh, Co-op helping things. And so uh, we're going to paint the fence. Uh, we're gonna, actually, we're going to stain it. And so if you have got tomorrow uh, available, uh, make that happen on Tuesday. We've got prayer time. And I know there's a handful of folks that get together, whether it's online or in person here. Uh, and we just pray. We just pray for things. In fact, I will say this, that um, for those of you that are new with us, maybe you've you, just found us online, or maybe you just, you know, you kind of stumbled on us. I want to say this. I don't think it's an accident or accident or a happenstance that you stumbled on us. I do believe that, um, that anything that happens, happens through prayer. And I believe because of our Tuesday night uh, folks being very faithful, that God is, is, has blessed us and God has shown us some incredible things. And so let me just say that um, as good as we think we are as staff or as good as we think we are as, 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 as uh, uh, people of, of, of Jesus, I will say this, that um, it is incredible what God can do through us and so I praise, I praise God for our prayer team. And so if you would like to be a part of that, and you may go, I don't, dude, I don't even, I don't, not a very good prayer, so I don't think I would be very good at being there. It doesn't matter. Uh, we need the folks to pray, and then we just need folks to just nod their head and agree with things, right? Uh, in Scripture, um, you'll hear, you know, we say amen after, after a prayer. You know what amen means? It means so be it. In other words, I agree with that. And so um, the reason it's put at the end of a prayer is because we all come together and agree on those things. And so it doesn't mean that God's going to do everything that we want exactly the way we want it, but it does mean that we just lift these things up to the Lord. And it's interesting to see people that have been, that have been healed, and uh, whether it's uh, uh, um, on their own, you know, just God kind of ha- makes it happen, or whether it's through the doctors and nurses or whatever, it's been interesting to see how God is, has um, taken situations and been able to turn them around for good. And so um, I think, I personally, I believe prayer works. I think that's why Paul says, pray all the time, pray continuously. And so Tuesday night, we have prayer time. It's from 7 to whenever you want to be there. If you're online, uh, now I know early on we had some folks hop online and they, they would keep their camera off and they would keep their mic off just to listen. And that's okay. That's okay. And so, but if you're here in, in-house, um, we'd love for you to be here 7 o'clock and whenever you need to leave, you go ahead and leave. Typically we leave around 8.15, 8.30, somewhere in there, give or take, whenever we land the plane. So I just want to encourage you on that. Uh, Wednesday, uh, there is... I can't remember what we're doing Wednesday, but Jim will tell you in a second. Uh, and then Thursday, we're at Emory Bread House. Uh, and so a lot, of, a lot of, oh, I know what Wednesday is. Duh, Wednesday's Wednesday night. That's what it is. That's what it is. Uh, now I know where I'll be on Wednesday. And so, which by the way, I'm going to tell you this. Wednesday, best eaten in town. The uh, way we work our small groups on Wednesday nights is everybody brings something to share. And again, I always say it goes from a bag of chips to something that somebody makes homemade and which is uh, incredible. And so it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to get to know one another and a great way to get into the word. And so that happens on Wednesday. Thursday, we are at Emory Bread House and Friday. That's when I don't know what we're doing. I can't remember what that is. But nonetheless, this is Serve Week. And so we encourage you whenever you can to jump in and engage and be a part of all of that. Hey, uh, we started a sermon series a few weeks ago. Uh, we just kind of looked at the parable of the sower, and we've kind of kind of hung out there. We kind of hovered over this parable for a bit. And so uh, we uh, a couple weeks ago, we kind of unpacked that. Uh, this past Sunday, uh, we'd be in Easter. Uh, we talked about being on the path. And the, what we really asked people to do was, and this is kind of your homework, and I don't remember if I really brought it up last week, um, because I don't like to give um, guests too much homework, right? That's kind of weird. Uh, but um, one of the things we talked about last week uh, that it, we need to ask ourselves a question is, how's the soil of my heart? So how's the soil of my heart? And so I hope that throughout this sermon series, you'll kind of ask that question. It's always good to ask that question, not of anybody else, but just you and the Lord getting together uh, and ask, asking him, so what's going on here? What do, we need to do, what do we need to do differently? What do we need to fix? Because all of us, all of us have, have, uh, are not perfect, and so therefore we all got things to, to work on. And, uh, and typically that happens with just us and the Lord. And so um, how's the soil of your heart? And so last week we talked about the path and how the path is a kind of a hard heart that where people are, um, they, they won't receive the word of God because they're really kind of unwilling to receive it. Maybe you've, you've seen people like 
like that before. They're like, eh, no, thank you, I'm good. And they just kind of go on their way. And that's just, that's just the reality of things. And so, um, but we kind of ask ourselves that question. So do I have a hard heart? Because I'm going to tell you something, in a moment, and you've probably seen it before, in the office or at home, we can have a hard heart just like that, right? Uh, it could be a certain uh, uh, situation. It could be a certain argument that we get in with other people uh, where we don't, we don't agree with them, and instantly we can, we can put up that shield and have that hard heart where we're not willing to listen to what they say. And we could do the same thing with God's Word. Uh, and so a hope is that we have a soft heart in order to hear what God is saying to us. And today we're going to kind of hang out with the rocky places uh, that Jesus talks about here. And so the question we're going to have today is, is our heart shallow? Uh, do we have, are there some, is there some superficialness about our, our heart uh, that, um, won't, that where we won't withstand the tests uh, that will surely come our way in this life? Because in this life, there's a lot of tests. And I will say this, as... And the world's always been sinful, but as, as Rich and I were just talking about a second ago, back in the back, as our world gets more and more sinful, as, as the sinfulness kind of seems like it's just building an, uh, exponentially on itself, I'm going to tell you something. If you haven't been tested as a believer in Christ, you will be tested. Uh, it's going to happen. And so I don't know about you, but I hate tests. I do, I do not like tests. Some people may be great taste te test takers. I'm not a very good test taker. I despise tests tests. I remember when I was 16 years old, um, had to have the driver's test. Now, I did not take driver's ed, uh, and so uh, I, I, grew up, I grew up in, in rural Indiana uh, where you could just, you know, drive a car and, and, and see nobody for miles and it'd be okay, and so I never took driver's ed, but the driver's test freaked me out, and it's a little different up in Indiana, and I don't know if they still do it this way up there or not than it is here, uh, but here you've got DMVs where you got cones, you go around and all that. There, they just took you out in the road just to see, hey, let's see how you do, you know? Uh, and yeah, so you got to avoid all the tractors and the combines that are around, but nonetheless. So my mom took me to Tipton. Uh, we lived in Tipton County, and so Tipton was the main, the main city in that county. And so she, we pulled up to the Tipton County Courthouse. And so I don't know if you've ever been to a courthouse before, but courthouses are weird to me. They all smell weird. They just smell strange to me. Maybe it's the, 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 the paper in there. I'm not really sure. So we pull up to the courthouse, and I walk in, and, and so we go to the counter where the, where the uh, um, Department of Motor Vehicles is at, and the, the lady, you know, kind of gruff, going, what do you want, you know? And I'm like, well, we're here to get a driving test. All right. And so she gets me set up, and I take the eye test first. I really wasn't freaked out about that. Made it through that, passed that okay. Then she gave me the written test, and I went off in this little desk just off to the side. You know, everybody's kind of hanging around, and I'm taking the test. And I missed, I missed one of the signs. It was the one where uh, it was the, uh, um, the slippery when wet sign. I had kind of, a, a, I think I put like a curvy road or something like that, you know. So, you know, uh, but that's the only one I missed. I did get the stop sign one correct, by the way. So, and then, then uh, I think I missed a couple other uh, questions that they had, like, you know, if you come up to a, to a stoplight and, the, and, there's, and there's a pedestrian going and it turns green, you know, should you A, honk your horn, tell the person to get out of your way? Should you B, wait for the person to get across? You know, C, uh, uh, just go ahead and just go or, you know, whatever. And I, I think I picked like A, you know, honk your horn, tell them, get out of the way, I'm coming through, right? So uh, I didn't know that was going to be great preparation for Atlanta, but nonetheless. And so, so I took that, took the driving test, and I guess I passed that. And then it got, well, the, the written test, and then it came for the driving test, right? And so um, the, the, the lady behind the counter came out, and she had her clipboard, and she goes, all right, let's get this done. Ta let's get this over with. And I'm thinking, that sounds kind of ominous, right? Let's get this over with. She was not excited at all, uh, very monotone in the way she approached things. And I thought, well, this could either go one of two ways. Either she's going to be really tough on me, or she doesn't care so much that she's just going to pass me anyway. It doesn't really matter. So we go out to Tipton tip County Courthouse. We walk down the steps. And you had to get into the car that you brought right with you, you know. Right? So and I so I get into my mom's Dodge Airy K car, Airy's K car. Ever seen a K car before? Right, right. So um, we had one of those, and it's very boxy. And so I got into that. And this lady, that's this strange lady, not strange in the fact that she was weird, just strange that I didn't know her. She gets into the seat beside me, and she's got the clipboard out, and she says, all right, let's go. And so we take off. And in, in that mo same monotone voice, she's like, 
take a right up here. And so I took the right. And then in that same voice, after I took the turn, she goes, took that kind of fast, didn't you? And then she starts writing in the clipboard. I'm like, no, 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 don't write, don't write, don't write. And I kind of look over to see what she was writing. And then so I went through all that. We went through di different streets uh, in Tipton uh, uh, City uh, and then came the dreaded parallel parking, right? The only place in my county that I knew parallel parking ever took place was around the courthouse in Tipton County. And so she, she, and she was, either she was scared of what I would do or she was being gracious to me, I don't know which, but we pull up and there's this long line of parallel parking spaces and there's a bunch of cars and then she picks the one in the very end where there's no car. And I'm thinking, oh, thank goodness. And so I was able to get in there, and I could, you know, I could have backed up all the way down the street if I wanted to, to get in there. And so I finally passed my test. But I remember sweat bullets. I didn't want to be the only one in my friend group, you know, to fail their driver's test, right? And so I absolutely hate, 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 hate tests. Uh, and yet, when we think about tests, um, it, there are times in our lives where God will allow tests to come in our lives. And really, when you think about tests, it's, it gives us an honest assessment as to how we're doing, right? No matter, what, no matter what the test is, it lets us know how much did I learn uh, from that study or how much do I know about a certain uh, a, a subject or whatever. It gives us an honest look at how we are really doing. And I'll be honest with you, there's a time or two that Art Stansberry just loves to, just loves to um, I just want to be in my own little world where I think I'm the best, but I'm really not. And but I'm okay with that, right? And so that's why, maybe that's why I don't like tests. I don't know. But yet, nonetheless, we all are going to find ourselves in a test at some point in time, especially as believers in Christ. And without those tests, we will never find out how we are really doing. We'll never be able to live up to our full potential as believers in Christ. We'll never really find out what kind of soil are we? What's, what's, what's the makeup within Art Stansberry when, when the screws get turned and uh, the heat is turned up? What, what's, what's he going to do? What does the faith of Art Stansberry really look like? And I think that's the purpose of tests that come into our lives. And so what kind of, what kind of faith is in the soil of our hearts? That's a great question for all of us to ask the Lord when we just get with him. Lord, so what, what kind, of, kind of soil do I have? Because when it comes to our relationship with God, the question is, where do we really stand with him? Where do we really stand with the Lord? We can, we can think to ourselves, well, I'm a good person and I do all these good things. And we can think, so I must be, I must be pretty good, but a lot of times our goodness is skewed, right? Because if you're like me, you kind of judge yourself by your motivations and everybody else by the things that they, that they, that they do or don't do. And so uh, that's sometimes I, I can, I can kind of skew it and bell, have a bell curve that makes it a little bit better for me. And here's, here's what I want you to know today. If you fall asleep or you, have to, you, have, you walk out today before uh, we, we finish today, here's what I want you to know. We are all in control of how deep we want our faith to grow. All of us, all of us are in control of that. So I don't want you to think that, well, you're a minister, and so therefore your faith's going to grow more because God must love you more because he's called you to be a minister. Uh -uh, not, not, that's, that's not the case. In fact, we were just talking before everything happened today, uh, just us and the band, and we mentioned that some of the most godly people, some of the most faithful people that I know, are not full, in full-time ministry. They're just people that you would be unassuming uh, in, other, in, 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 in the church world. But they have spent so much time with the Lord. They have grown their faith to the point uh, where it is just much further than I could ever, ever even imagine or even think about. And so the question I have for us is how deep, how really deep is our faith? I think this is the, the, one of the reasons that Jesus tells this story that we're about to read yet again. And here's the parable of the sower. Jesus just says, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering seeds, some fell along the path and it was trampled on. Then the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. And still other seed fell on 
the good soil, it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. And then I want you to listen to what Jesus says next because what he says next is important for us to hear because then Jesus says, it says that when he had said this, after he had given this parable, it says that he calls out, and the word called out is, uh, is a Greek word that we, where we get our word phone from, uh, and it means that he calls out in a loud voice so that everybody could hear. And so he's kind of, he kind of raises his voice, which by the way, in all of scripture, we don't have very many instances where Jesus actually raises his voice, but Jesus raises his voice and he says these words, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, listen up to what I just said. Did you pay attention to what I just told you? Now, why is that important? Why would, why would Jesus say that? I think it's because that in the crowd, you had, I mean, you had regular Joes, right? Just regular people out in the, out in the crowd. You had the Pharisees who were there and the religious leaders that were uh, probably with their clipboards taking notes about Jesus. And then you had those that were the disciples. And this isn't just the 12 disciples, but this is some other people that have kind of, you know, supported Jesus and are kind of walking with Jesus as well. And they were individually, all of them, in the crowd. Everybody in that crowd, from the regular Joes to the Pharisees to the disciples, were individually in control of how deeply they wanted their faith to grow in God. All of them were. You might remember we read a, uh, uh, this a couple weeks ago in verse 9 and 10, where his disciples, it says his disciples asked, asked him what this parable meant. And so Jesus said, well, the knowledge of the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, and though hearing, they may not understand. And so we mentioned that Jesus spoke plainly to the disciples because they wanted to understand. They wanted to know what Jesus was saying. They wanted their faith to grow in God. They wanted a deeper relationship with God, and so they were willing to lean in to what Jesus was saying. And the passage reminds us that we are all in control of how deep we want our faith to grow. See, your, your faith can grow not because you've got a, maybe a, a minister that you go, oh, I like, I like the way he preaches, or I like the way he talks, or I like to listen to that person on YouTube because they really help me out. That's all well and good, but really you're in control. You are in control. Not the minister, not the teachers you put around you. You're in control of how deep that you want your faith to grow. How much are you willing to lean in? How much are you willing to get into God's word? How much are you willing to pray? How much are you willing to spend time with him? And so I want us to kind of look just real quickly and just pay particular attention to what Jesus calls here is the rocky places. Listen to how Jesus describes the soil of the rocky places in verse 13. He says, um, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in, time, in the time of testing, they fall away. Matthew kind of puts this a little bit differently. And maybe this, either, either maybe sometimes, depending on how our brains work, we, look at, we listen to Luke and go, oh, I get it. Or we listen to Matthew and go, oh, no, I get that better. So I want, to, I want to also read what Matthew says in Matthew 13, verse 5. He says this, Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. Isn't it interesting? He uses that word shallow. So how is your, how's your faith? Is your faith deep or is it Shallow. Is it on shaky ground in times of testing or is it in a place where your faith can withstand and weather some of the tests that may come your way? Now, you may be thinking, Art, right, you've gone from preaching to meddling, all right? So be careful about it. Be careful, Art, right, where, you, where you step, right? But here's some great news. Here's the great news, and here's what I want you to hear about this because I don't want you to feel bad about, about oh, no, I'm not there yet or I'm, I'm not where I ought to be because, quite frankly, none of us are, right? None of us are. But here's what I want you to hear. No matter how strong your faith is, or no matter how much strengthening your faith needs, here's the great news. We are all in control. We are all in control of how deep we want our faith to grow. And that's the, that's the great thing. We're in control of that. 
if we want it, all we have to do is pursue it. Or maybe I should say it this way. If you want it, all you have to do is pursue God. That's what we have to do. When I think about, when I think about deep faith, I think about Abraham of the Old Testament. In fact, there's a lot devoted to him, even in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is kind of like the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the heroes of the faith, so to speak. And Abraham takes up quite a bit of real estate in Hebrews chapter 11. And you got to know that Abraham's faith didn't just grow overnight. He didn't just wake up going, man, I feel like I'm more faithful than I was before I went to sleep. And I think I'm more faithful now. It just didn't grow. God just didn't sprinkle Faith, dust, that, that's not a thing. But he didn't just, in other words, he didn't take a pill. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't uh, uh, drink some kind of special drink. Uh, he didn't do any of that kind of stuff. His faith grew over time as he spent time with the Lord. It happens, growing our faith happens slowly as we stack right decisions. That's how our faith grows. And I believe that Abraham's faith grew as he simply stacked right decision after right decision, after right decision, after right decision. The more time that he spent with God, the deeper his faith grew. God told Abraham, leave your home. Go to this place that I'm going to tell you about, but I'm not going to tell you about it. You just get up, pack up, get your U-Haul ready, and you go out the, out the door. I'm going to tell you where to go. There was no map. There was no GPS. There was no, uh, I, I'm going to dot the map here. He just got up and went, and God told him, yep, keep driving. Turn right, turn left, and there you are. He did it. He just followed after God. There was no business plan in what was going to happen. There's none of that. God said it, and Abraham believed it. And after he believed it, he did something about it. He pursued God. And each time Abraham listened to God and did what God said, his faith grew. You may, remember, you may have heard me use this definition before in faith, uh, and this is just art's definition, but faith is doing what God says. Faith is doing what God says. You can have all the knowledge up here, but if we don't do what God says in his word, then do we really have faith in God, right? Faith is doing what God says. So what does this look like for you and me, right? We see it for Abraham, and we, we kind of wonder, you know, how did God talk to Abraham? I don't know. I don't know if, that's, if it was a still, small voice. We know that God did show up uh, in, to Abraham in many ways, uh, in visions, in dreams. Uh, he actually showed up, uh, you know, in skin uh, as a man. Uh, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But we don't know if he heard a loud voice from heaven all the time. We don't really know, but we do know that he did speak with God. But what's that mean for you and for me? Because I'll be honest with you, I don't, know if, I don't know if I've ever heard an audible voice. If I have, I didn't pay attention to what that was. But I've heard the still, small voice in my heart. And if you go, I don't know if I've ever heard God speak before. Let me just give you a pro tip. If you read God's word, it's God speaking to you. And so if you've read God's word, you've heard him speak to you. Okay, uh, And so you qualify, right? Because all of us are in control of how much we want our faith to grow. And so, how does that work for you and I? Well, first of all, it's this. It's spending time with God. Spending time with Him. How do we do that? Reading God's Word and in prayer. Reading God's Word and prayer. In fact, Jim's going to share with us a reading plan that we're going to do this uh, over the next three months. Uh, and it's, it's intensive. In fact, Jim said, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of reading. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and so you may have to break it up uh, at somewhere along the way. I don't know. Uh, break it up through your day. Maybe you have to listen to it as you drive. I'm not sure how you're going to be, how you're going to do this, or how you're going to navigate it. But it is a lot. It is a lot. But you know what? It's not. It's nothing that we can't do. I don't know about you, but I probably watch way more TV than I do reading God's Word. Probably watch uh, way too many sport sporting events. Right? If I can sit down and watch a football game, which what three hours long or two hours long or whatever, uh, and uh, and so. I think if we can do that, we can also do this as well. So the next, this reading plan is going to be, going to be, a, 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 it's going to be a, a test for all of us. But basically, it's spending time with God, praying and reading. And number two, it's just putting God's word into action. Whatever we read, going, I'm going to put that one thing. You know, and here's, the, here's a pro tip for you. Whenever you read, just look for one thing that pops out off the page at you. 
And I love to underline in my Bible. It's not, I mean, God's not going to ding you in heaven for that, going, huh, I would let you in, but you wrote in your Bible. I'm sorry, that's going to keep you out of heaven. It's not, that's not the case. I love to write in my Bible. I love to highlight so that I can find things a little quicker. And so let me encourage you that as you read this week, as you decide that you're going to take on this challenge, this huge challenge we're going to give to you as, uh, in, in reading God's Word this week, that you just look for one thing that just pops out to you and just underline that very thing. And so... That's what we want to do. And we just take that one thing and try to put it in, into action as best as we can. And here's the thing. The more time we spend with God, the deeper our faith will grow. It's, I promise you, it is not rocket science. It is not rocket science because we are in control of how deep we want our faith to go with God. Did Abraham make mistakes? You bet he did. He made mistakes. And what's incredible is it's out there for, it's on display for us to see. Abraham did not trust God enough when they went to Egypt. There was a famine in the land. Him and Sarah and his whole entourage, they go to Egypt. And, and uh, Abraham decides, hey, listen, if someone asks you if we're married, just say you're my sister. Uh, I felt like that was going to be a safer thing. I'm not sure why, uh, but he did. It's dumb, right? So, uh, and so he, he, he says that. And so uh, Pharaoh looks over at Sarah and goes, wow, she's a... She's a looker, and so uh, he, you know, he, he, he you know, texts her and says, would you kind of go out with me? And she's like, mm. and God starts doing some things against Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's like, what in the world? Uh, and he finds out that Sarah is married to Abraham, and Pharaoh's like, what in the world are you doing to me, Abraham? You're killing me, man. Uh, and so he gives Abraham a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, I'm talking um, properties and, and, and money and all of that, and one of the properties that came with that was a slave by the name of Hagar. Now, if he had never, first of all, even been to Egypt and never had lied, then that probably would not have happened. And so he makes this mistake. And then the next mistake that him and Sarah make is because God makes this huge promise that you're going to have a son and he's going he's to be the start of this incredible nation. And they think, well, God's been a little bit slow in making this promise come about. So how about we help God out? And Sarah goes, how about taking Hagar, you can marry her and then we'll have a child through her. How about that? And so they tried to circumvent God's blessing, his promise, uh, and that was a huge mistake. So Abraham made huge mistakes. But here's what I want you to know, that every time he made a mistake, he pivoted back to God, right? That's what, re that's what repentance is all about. That's what forgiveness is all about. He, he pivoted back to God. And here's the thing. As you begin to grow in your faith, as we all begin to grow in our faith, don't ever, 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 ever give up on God because he has not given up on you, right? As we, as we said even last week, you could take a thousand steps from God, take one step back, and there he is. You know, kind of run into him like, whoa, there you are, right? Because he loves us, he cares for us. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us. And so even in spite of his mistakes, Abraham spent time with God. And the more faithful that we, um, we find ourselves being, the more time we spend with him, there's an interesting byproduct that happens. The more, the more we do this, the more we spend time in his word, the more we pray, the more, the more we do these things, oddly enough, the more God begins to speak to us. God begins to let us into, and this is going to sound weird, but kind of the inner circle a little bit, um, and he kind of lets us kind of into his life, and that may sound kind of weird, you're like, but art, I mean, is like, you know, like God playing favorites or something? No, that's not, not what's happened, but in some ways, we do this, too, in our relationships, right? So there are certain things that I will share with Christy that I will not share with you, because Christy is my wife. She's my bride. We, we've got this commitment to one another, uh, and we've got this bond that you and I don't have, and so there may be certain things that I will share with her that I will never share with you, that I'll never even share with the boys, with Caleb or Landon, just between the two of us. And there may be some other things that for some of you, uh, that if you the, the mo more we spend time with one another and the more commitment uh, we have, the more trust there is, the more we begin to share with certain people that we won't share with other people because they don't have that same level of trust. There's not that same level of commitment. There's not that, that deep uh, uh, relationship, right? Uh, the more you spend time with someone, whether it's a friend or whether it is uh, a, a, a husband or a wife, the more you begin to build that bond and the more you feel like you can share with them. Same thing happens with God. 
Same things happens with him. The deeper the commitment, the deeper the faith, and the deeper of level of trust that God begins to share with us. Quite frankly, some of the people that, you, that maybe you listen to on the internet, uh, preachers and, and teachers, that you're like, wow, I never, I never thought about that before. That's incredible. Uh, you know, you could do that too. You could do that too. Because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Us ministers, we ain't all that in a bag of chips, right? We're just regular people spending time with God. God may share some things with us, but quite frankly, as I said before, there's other people that aren't even uh, full-time ministers that are incredible. One of those uh, was Bruce Burdick, if you guys remember Bruce Burdick. Man, what an incredible guy. Man, what a uh, giant in the faith. He went on to be with the Lord, but what a giant in the faith. And so God begins to share with Abraham things that he doesn't share with other people. Case in point, Genesis chapter 18. God comes to visit Abraham as a man, and there's two angels that come as, a, as, as men as well. Uh, and, at the, and, and, and Abraham feeds them, uh, hangs out with them for a little bit. Uh, and then um, at the end of their visit, God does something very interesting. Uh, it says in verse 16 that when the men got up to leave, uh, this is God and these two angels, because they looked like men. When these men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom. This is before Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed. And Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. And then the Lord said, and this is interesting, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? That's an interesting question to me. Um, in other words, he kind of asked, do you reckon I, ought to, reckon I ought to share with Abraham what's about to go down? You reckon I ought to share with him a little bit of the inside scoop of what's about to take place? And verse 18 says, Abraham, he, God says this, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations on the earth will be blessed through him, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. In other words, this information may come in handy for Abraham and his family in the future, his descendants in the future. You know, Abraham's been faithful, been faithful. He's been, been, been a, a, a faithful friend. And after, after, they, after all, they've got this deep connection, right? There's this deep connection that God and Abraham have. And so the Lord begins to share with Abraham what he is about to do. And What's interesting is he doesn't, doesn't share this, at least in Scripture, we don't see this. God does not share this with any other person on the planet. That, to me, is interesting. Doesn't share this with any other person on the planet. Listen to what he shares. Verse 20, it says, The Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not... I will know. This just, I kind of pull back from this. And just what I see by, in, in this is that God is gracious. He is so gracious to us as people. So gracious enough that he is willing to step out of heaven and see firsthand how bad things really are. To get eyeball to eyeball with us and eyeball to eyeball with our sin. To see if any other way or any other thing can be done. And that's why... In the future, God would send Jesus, his one and only son, to save, to save us so that he could get eyeball to eyeball with us, to know what we are going through and to do something about our sin, to die for our sin. And so God is so gracious with all of us, so, so gracious. He was gracious with Sodom and Gomorrah. Unfortunately, the people were unwilling to do what God wanted them to do. But do you know who God did not share this with. He didn't share it with the one person who was living in Sodom at the time, a guy named Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. There was a time where uh, Abraham said, hey, listen, our herds are getting way too big. They keep bumping into one another and, and all that. And he goes, you pick it. You, go, you pick north, south, east, west. If you go north, I'll go south. If you go east, I'll go west. Lot looked out. He saw the most lush land around Sodom and goes, man, that's where I want to go. Abraham said, cool. Abraham went the other direction. And so Lot ended up in Sodom. But why didn't God share this information with Lot? Because it was going to directly impact him and his family. I mean, directly 
impact him. Why in the world would he share it with Abraham but not Lot? Was it because Lot was a bad guy? Nope. In fact, in 2 Peter, we are told uh, that Lot was a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. He even says in verse 8, for that righteous man living among them day, day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds that he saw and he heard. He was tortured by that. So it wasn't because Lot was a bad guy. It wasn't because he wasn't righteous. Why, why does God share with Abraham this information, but he doesn't share it with Lot? Why doesn't he do that? I believe it's because God had a stronger relationship with Abraham. There was a deeper connection. And Abraham had such a commitment to the Lord that the Lord decided to share with him what was about to take place, to let him into kind of that inner circle a little bit to hear what was about to take place. You see, the deeper the commitment, the deeper the faith, and the deeper the level of trust that God begins to give to us. And God affords Abraham a luxury that he doesn't share with anyone else on the planet. And I look at that and I think, I want that. I mean, don't you want a deeper connection with God? That not that he shares like, hey, I'm about ready to destroy this place. What do you think about that? Not saying that, but I'm just a deeper connection. That when you open up God's word, that all of a sudden now it's where before you kind of struggled to see things. Now it's like one thing after another coming at you. God's just speaking to you through his word, and you're just, you're just taking all this in. It's like you're drinking from the fire hose now, right? Don't you kind of want that? Don't you kind of want to know that all of this is real, right? Don't you want to kind of, I mean, because I'll be, I'll be honest with you, there may, some of you maybe go, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't get all this, right? I, come, I mean, and I think this, for a new person who doesn't know anything about God, if they come to church, church would be weird, right? You're gonna, so we're going to come in to a place where we don't know, yeah, they got coffee and donuts, but so does Duncan, right? And so we're going to come in and we're going to sit in these, these chairs. We're going to all face this direction and we're going to sing these songs. How off, how, where else do we just come and sing a song you know, with, with one another, right? And then we're going to hear some Yehu speak about this ancient book. And afterwards, we're going to say, have a great week. We'll see you later, right? You see, this wouldn't make any sense if it wasn't the fact that God is here, that the Holy Spirit is here, and that we get a chance to as iron sharpens iron, encourage one another. And so all this would be kind of strange, right? Uh, and so for some of you, you may look at this and go, I, just don't, I don't know if this is real or not. But I'm going to tell you something. The more you begin to dive in, the more you begin to lean in to God's word, the more you lean into prayer, the more you really engage yourself and allow yourself uh, to, uh, to commit to these things, the more you're going to see God go, okay, I see you. Okay, here you go. And you're going to go, oh, that was the Lord. Where some things we may have in years past said, oh, it was a coincidence. Now we go, there is no coincidence. I see God working. I see God moving. I see God doing certain things. And so I look at this passage in Genesis 18, and I think, I want this. I don't know what this is, but I want it. Because it allows us to understand that God is real. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul actually prays this over not only the people in Ephesus, but also for us. I want you to listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 21. I tried to stop it earlier in the passage, but I just couldn't. I just had to read the whole thing. So here's what he says. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. What is Paul going to pray for these people for, right? Right? What is Paul going to petition God for? Well, in verse 17, he says this, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you, listen to this, lean into this, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. All of this right here, all of this that we're doing, all of this, and everything on Wednesday nights, and everything that's going to happen in Serve Week, all of this is so that we might know God better and so that others will have an opportunity to know God better. That's what it's all about. That's what reading God's Word is all about because this book lets us know this is how God reveals Himself to you and to me, where we go, oh, now I see 
who God is. Now I know him. Then in verse 18, he says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. So we see we see that there's God, that God wants us to know him. He wants you to lean in. You are in control. You're, you are in control of how much, how deep your faith is going to grow. And God so desperately wants to reveal more and more of himself to you. And you may think, to me, why would he want to do that? Because he loves you. How do you know he loves me, Art? Because of the cross. Because he would send his one and only son to die for you and for me. To die for our sins. That's how I know he loves us. And he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to know us. You know, it's interesting when you start looking at the scriptures that we start seeing some differences in how God interacted with certain people. Like if you go to the book of Daniel, God interacted differently with Daniel than he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He shared with things with, he shared things with Daniel that he did not share with the other three it's very interesting, and it could cause us to wonder, why in the world? Well, my guess is, my guess is that it's because of Daniel's faith, that there was a deeper faith, and maybe uh, within Daniel's spirit, a, a, a pursuing after God, maybe just a little bit more than, than those around him. Jesus did this with Peter and James and John. He would pull them to the side, and they would have these incredible adventures with Jesus that the other nine disciples didn't have. It's very interesting how Jesus, even Jesus, interacted with them. Was it because the, 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 the other nine weren't as, uh, weren't as good guys? No, they were great guys. They were great guys. They went on to do some incredible things. But for whatever reason, Peter, James, and John maybe leaned in just a little bit more than everybody else. You see, we are in control of how deep we want our faith to grow. The only question is, do you want to know him? I mean, that really is the question. Because at any point in time, we can stiff arm God. We can do that. We can stiff, we go, no, no, God, I, I'm done. I don't, I don't want to know. I don't want to know anymore. You know, sometimes it happens out of fear. And sometimes it just happens because out of laziness, we, we don't want to do what God's asking us to do. Sometimes it's out of disobedience that that happens. And so my question is, are, are you content? Are you content with a superficial, shallow faith? Not to say that yours is, but are you content with that? that may or may not withstand the tests that will come our way in this sinful world? Are, am, I, am I content with that? Just have a shallow faith? Jesus says that those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy and when they hear it, but they have no root. And they believe for a little while, but in time of testing, they check out. Peace out, God. See you later. Oh, you can stay in the rocky ground if you want to. God will let you do that. He's the perfect gentleman. I promise you, God is the perfect gentleman. He will allow you to stay in the rocky ground if you'd like to. You can choose to have one foot in the world and one foot uh, in his kingdom. You're welcome to do that. But what happens when stuff starts hitting the fan in our lives? What happens when things happen uh, that, uh, that cause us to uh, be curious of, to whether God really is at work or what's going on in our lives and what happens when times get tough, what happens when things don't quite work out the way that we want them to work out. And so are you looking for deeper soil? Are you looking for deeper soil to plant your faith in? Remember, this is good news for us. I mean, this is great news because you and I, we're in control. We're in control of how deep we want our faith to grow. And if you want it to grow deep, I'm going to tell you something. God, he is right there. He's like, all right, sign me up. He's always wanting to be with us. You may have people in your life that you go, man, I want to be their friend, but they just, for whatever reason, they don't want me in their life, right? And you're like, dude, what's not to like, right? That's not God, I promise you. 
That's not God. God wants to spend time with you. God cares for you more than anything. And I'm telling you, relationships are hard work. They are hard work. Being a friend isn't easy. Being a parent isn't easy. Having a relationship with your kids takes work. Have a relationship uh, with, uh, you know, with, your, with your husband or your wife takes work. It is not easy being Christy Stansberry, I promise you, all right? It's not easy putting up with this guy. And being a faithful follower of Jesus isn't easy. It's not easy. It takes work. It takes work. And not many people are willing to put in the hard work of reading God's word. Because it is work. It is work to some degree. Not many people are willing to put in the hard work of spending time in prayer. Not many people are willing to put in the hard work of actually doing what God says, being obedient to him. Not many people are willing to put in the hard work of jumping into a serve week, right, and doing the things that God has called us to do. But here's the thing. You and I, we're in control. We're in control of how much we want our faith to grow. All we have to do is ask the Lord, Lord, I just want to follow you. Man, he'll be there in a heartbeat. With every prayer that you pray, with every passage that you read, with every passage that you study, with every effort that you make to be here at church, uh, whether it's even coming down those steps, you know, uh, whether, or, or you know, being driven all the way around here, with every effort that you make to serve him, whether it's slinging coffee on Sunday mornings, coming here early to be up on stage, or whether it's a serve week that's about to take place, with every faithful decision that you make, your faith is growing deeper and deeper and deeper in him. And the further we get away from being in the rocky soil, Church history tells us that John the Apostle um, was um, boiled in oil. In fact, the Roman Emperor Domitian uh, commanded that the Apostle be boiled in oil to death. And so he was placed in this, this is church history, you won't find it in scriptures, he was placed in this pot, and from the pot he was still preaching the gospel. It didn't affect him. And then, because that didn't affect him, they decided to make him drink poison, to which it didn't work. Uh, he still continued to preach. And finally, finally, they just said, well, we got to get rid of him somehow. And so they sent him off. They banished him to the island of Patmos in A.D. 97. And yet, beyond, beyond, with all those things that happened, being boiled in oil, which didn't work, and being given uh, poison that didn't work, he was still faithful to God. And what does God do? While he was on that island, God gave him a sneak peek behind the curtain. And he was allowed to receive one of the most incredible visions that anyone has been able to receive. He got to see, he got the honor of seeing the book of Revelation. And he wrote that down so that you and I could read what he saw, what God had given to him. Let me encourage you with this. Let me encourage you. Don't give up on God, no matter what happens. No matter, no matter how uh, uh, intense life gets, don't give up on him. Don't fear the testing. Don't fear what might come. What, in fact, what would it look like? What would it look like if you leaned into your struggles uh, and you faced uh, what God uh, either, either allowed in your life or what was happening from the world? What would happen if you just faced it by just digging your heels in and continuing to spend time with God, reading his word and prayer? What would it look like if you refused to give up and, and, and take a shortcut and you actually put what God says into action. What would that look like? What would that look like for you? And I'm telling you, there's no telling how deep your faith would grow if all of us just simply leaned in and walked after God and pursued him with all of our might. That's our hope for all of us, that we would do that, that we would lean in to Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. You are always faithful. Even when we are not faithful, you are always faithful. And Lord, I give you praise and glory and honor that you have given every one of us, every one of us, the ability to know you. You've given us the ability to um, decide for ourselves how much of you we want and how much of you uh, we want to uh, listen to. You've given us the ability, Father God, to decide uh, how, how deep our faith will grow in you and how deep our relationship with you will be. Father, I pray that you would 
for our MC3ers, uh, for all those that are here, Lord God, that we would desire more of you, that it would be, as John the Baptist put it, more of you and less of us, Father God, so that you might be glorified, so that you might be lifted up, and so that we might be used for you in ways we never thought possible. And so, Father God, I pray this week that you would help us to lean into your word, lean into um, uh, uh, your service, and to lean in to the faith that you called us to. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Art, and what a great message that was. Um, at the beginning, at the beginning, Art asked a very important question. Actually, I guess he asked it all through the sermon, but the question is, is how deep is your faith? And he outlined a couple of principles that can help us answer that question. One, we are in control of how deep we want our faith to grow. And two, the more time we spend with God, the deeper our faith will grow. Um, I've said it before, you guys have heard me say this before up here, uh, but I despise that term mature Christian, and I'm always a bit suspect when people use it. I actually prefer the term growing in faith to describe whatever your relationship is with the Lord. Uh, but that aside, our faith certainly does start out in an immature place, um, uh, and it has to grow. It's a good place to start, but it needs to grow. Um, as one, man, uh, as one man said to Jesus in Mark 9, 24, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Uh, I've always found that interesting. When it comes to faith journeys, I often think about the disciples who lived and ministered with Jesus. They had three years with Jesus. Uh, they spent time with him one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, they saw him at work up close and personal. They watched him get arrested and crucified. And then they saw a resurrected Jesus, even ate a meal with him. And then they were actually with him uh, on the Mount of Olives when he ascended into heaven. And yet, in that amazing moment, after everything that they had seen and done with Jesus, uh, this is what Matthew 28, 17 tells us. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Uh, it's amazing to me. Uh, it shouldn't be, but it is. Uh, so, so think about the Lord's Supper, that very first Lord's Supper when Jesus gathered with his 12 disciples in the upper room to eat the Passover meal. Uh, Matthew 26, 28 tells us, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his, to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of, of sins. So, given that, that they were in the upper room and Jesus said that, did you think that the disciples heard Jesus say what he just said and they fully grasped the meaning of communion as we know it today? Highly doubtful, highly doubtful. Uh, they had to learn. They had to learn what communion meant, and then they had to draw closer to their faith just like we do today. I think what I love about the communion table is that it's the perfect place for us to be no matter where we are in our faith journey. Whether we're just starting out, whether we're struggling with doubt, uh, whether we have trust issues with the Lord, or even whether we're just ready to, uh, we're just ready and waiting for the Lord to take us home to be in heaven with him. Uh, the communion table is the perfect place to be. Uh, no matter where you are, no matter where you are in your faith journey, there is tremendous weight in taking part in God's church and in being here at the communion table and in coming together to remember that Jesus died for our sins, uh, my sins and your sins. Let's pray. Dear Lord, um, thank you for meeting us where we are in our faith journey. Um, no matter where we are or what we're going through, Lord, um, we can count on you and your Holy Spirit to help us. We know that you have a plan for our life, that you want good things for us, and we just pray, God, that we will seek you first and foremost, and that we will follow wherever you lead us. Lord, we thank you especially for your sacrifice, for sending your Son to the cross to die for our sins, our shortcomings, and our failures. From the moment we sin, God, from the moment we sin, you had a plan for our salvation. We thank you so much for that. We know how important that is. But God, we thank you even more, Lord, for, for what you offer us in this life, right here on earth, God, that chance to learn about you and to follow you and to seek your plan for our life.
to trust in you, and to have faith in your eternal goodness, your mercy, and your grace. It's a true blessing, and we are so grateful. In all things, Lord, we ask your blessings, and your will be done. Amen. We're ready for communion, God. Just come forward. There's tables up front. There's two tables in the back. If you need someone to bring it to you, just raise your hand. We'll do that. Uh, if you need prayer uh, or if you're ready to give your life to Christ, Art will be over here. I'll be over here.